Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Megan Simmons. I am currently a sophomore at Barnard College of Columbia University up in New York City, where I study political science. Um, and I have the great opportunity and fortune to be here today because I was able to serve as a student advisor for TNTP over the summer in the lead up to the launch of the Opportunity Myth. So thank you so much to Shannon and everybody at TNTP for having me here, giving me the opportunity to speak, and most importantly, for listening to the thoughts and opinions of students every step of the way. So during my time on the panel this summer, one of the things we talked about the most was the purpose of school in general. You know, what is the purpose of an education? What is the point of going to school every day? And to be completely honest, I had never really thought about this before. Sure, I had thought about what I would change about school and if I was made secretary of education for the day, what I would immediately do, but I had never really thought of the overriding purpose of school in general. So I kept thinking about it. And the more I thought about it, I realized that my entire life, I was told that the point of school was to get you to college. When I was in first grade, I remember we were in the between switching classes and I raised my hand and I said to the teacher, you know, reading is great and like math is fun, but when are we gonna do what we're interested in? When are we gonna learn about the stuff that we like and what we find fun? You know, I like dance. When am I gonna learn about the history of dance? And she said to me, well, that's not the point of school. And I guess I looked a little confused, so she kept going and she said, the point of what we're doing here is so that you can do well in the rest of elementary school which you need to do so that you can do well in middle school, which you need to do so that you can do well in high school, which you need to do so that you can get into college. And so from that moment on, it was clear to me that for the rest of my time in school, the next 11 years of my life, the point of it was to get into college. College was like the finish line. No one really talked about what happened once you crossed the finish line or what happened when you got to college, what your college classes would be like, or anything even beyond that. You just had to get to this finish line and every opportunity would be there for you. It was like an equation. Get good grades plus work hard equals college equals success. So in my school district, this resulted in students being stressed about college from a very, very early age. By fourth grade, I decided that I wanted to go to Duke because that was the team my family rooted for during NCAA basketball. And once in fourth grade math class, I literally started crying because I didn't understand a geometry concept. And I was so convinced that because I didn't understand this one concept in fourth grade, I wasn't gonna be able to get into Duke. So my whole life, I was told that everything was about getting into college. The classes we took were based on what would boost your GPA and make your transcript look good, not because you found the class interesting or because it would help you develop as a person or a student. The message was sent that nothing really counted, nothing was really real until you turned 18. And when you're constantly having classes and schedules picked for you and pre-written assignments handed to you, there's little room for deeper engagement or student voice. And I was frustrated, and it wasn't just normal teen angst, I was frustrated because there was a world of topics and problems out there that were bigger than math sheets or book reports. I and everyone around me had interests that we wanted to study. We had ideas that we wanted to put into action. But in the battle between deeper learning and prep, college prep work, deeper learning always lost out. And this wasn't because our teachers didn't want to talk about the topics that we were interested in, or they didn't believe that our ideas had value or merit. It was because we existed in a system that didn't. And these norms continued to communicate that nothing mattered unless it helped us get to that finish line. But what happened after you crossed that finish line? That was what nobody talked about. And what if you never got to the finish line? If hard work plus good grades equals college equals success, what happens if you do work hard and you do make good grades, but you're not able to attend college? Does that mean that you're a failure? If you don't go to college, if you don't get to that finish line that's been created already for us, regardless of what we're interested or what we want to do, does that mean that at 17 or 18 years old, you're already a failure? Young people are given a hard time. We're told that we're apathetic and we're lazy and we don't care. But if you're put in this system where someone's created your end goal for you and they're told that nothing matters unless you reach that, wouldn't you kind of be too? 
So while I was reading the opportunity myth, I found myself nodding in agreement in pretty much everything that was written down. Suddenly, the unwritten rules of my school experience were written down and presented as fact, and that was empowering. But like Maggie in the opportunity myth, I and the majority of my high school classmates are white. I reached that finish line, but only because I had parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and siblings who went through the process before me. I had parents who were able and willing to give me the necessary yet extraordinarily expensive resources it takes to navigate the process. I now work for Student Voice, which is a national student-run 501c3 organization, and we aim to activate student voices to improve and change the education system because we know that students are the people most impacted by education policy, but are rarely asked their opinions on it. I talk to students across the country on a daily basis who have thoughts and ideas and opinions, and they want to put them into action. But as said in the opportunity myth, school is not honoring their aspirations or setting them up for success. But I have hope. I'm not here to start off the day on a depressing note that nothing can get better. Every day, I see students become more involved in civic participation. Young people are leading walkouts and movements and leveraging technology and social media to create a better world when those with power won't do so. There are students in Oregon who are writing a state of schools report on the state of school climate in Oregon. Students in Kentucky testify between, before their state legislature on a regular basis about school funding in Kentucky, and they even wrote a book about college readiness from the student perspective. Then in Boston, there's the Boston Student Advisory Council, who fight for student representation in education decision-making spaces. And in North Carolina, another student-led nonprofit, Kinston Teens, uses servant leadership to foster community, positive community growth by offering youth programs and service opportunities to nearly 3,000 people. And this all started with people, high schoolers, who had an idea and put it into action. Everyone in this room and all of those students and organizations I just mentioned know that education is so much more than just getting you into college. And as we see in the opportunity myth, when students are challenged and taken seriously, when teachers give them opportunities to collaborate and think deeply about issues and materials, education becomes a tool to change the world, not just what gets you into college. So I want to say thank you to everyone at TNTP for investing in this report and spending so many years on it because they believe that students are capable of more than what we're currently tasked with. And thank you to everybody here for being able and willing to listen and empathize and let students tell you what we want and need from our education. And with that, I'd like to introduce the CEO of TNTP, Dan Weissman. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate that. Good morning, everybody. That's nice, a lot of energy. Um, thank you so much for being here. My name is Dan Weisberg. I'm the CEO of TNTP. For those who don't know us, we are a national education nonprofit founded 21 years ago by teachers to end the injustice of education and equality by ensuring that all students have access every day in every class, every grade, every school, every subject, every community to great teachers and great teaching. We're here today to present and discuss the findings from our sixth national report, The Opportunity Myth, what students can show us about how school is letting them down and how to fix it. Before turning it over to our student panel, uh, I'm gonna take about 20, 25 minutes and take you through our findings. So in The Opportunity Myth, we examine the quality of student academic experiences in school and the effect on the, their long-term success. We isolated the factors which affect those experiences and student achievement. And those of you who know our work know that this is a bit of a departure for us. In the past, we've examined important, significant, uh, but pretty discreet operational challenges involving teachers. Teacher evaluation, teacher staffing, recruitment, teacher retention, teacher development. This time around, we, we looked at the record number of students who are graduating high school, enrolling in college, finding themselves unprepared, being shunted into remediation, and not reaching their goal of getting a college diploma. And we wanted to know why. We wanted to know why at a root level, at a classroom level, at a student level. 
And so this report, at the heart of it, are real students. Students like Megan, students like the students you'll hear on a student panel in a couple of minutes. It's about their aspirations, their hopes, their challenges, and how school sets them up or doesn't set them up to reach their goals. We all ask students to aim high. We, and as we'll see, they do. We ask them to come to school every day, do the work we assign, work diligently in school and at home, all with the promise that they do, they will graduate high school on time, ready for college, and a productive career. We further promise that all students will have this opportunity, that if they just do what we ask, they will be on the path to success. Unfortunately, what we found in the course of doing this study is that that promise is a myth. Opportunity in our schools is a scarce resource, and it is not distributed equitably. In spite of the heroic efforts of millions of educators around the country doing their best, working incredibly hard to do their best for students. We found, as we'll talk about in a second, that students are holding up their end of the bargain. They're doing what we ask. They're doing the work that they're assigned. But in most cases, those of us responsible for systems are making choices which don't give them a real opportunity to succeed. Okay, the report, how do we do it? To conduct this study, we partnered with five school systems. Three urban districts, one rural district, one charter management organization, we followed almost 4,000 students during the 2016-2017 school year. We gathered almost 5,000 assignments, almost 25,000 pieces of student work which we analyzed to measure assignment quality. Our norm-trained observers conducted over 1,000 hours of full period observations using standard tools to measure the quality of instruction. We, sur we surveyed our 250 teachers about their practices, their views, and their expectations for their students. Most importantly, we surveyed students in the moment, in class, in school, over 30,000 times in order to get insight into the daily experiences of students. Our school system partners also gave us unparalleled access to student grades, to test scores, to information on courses and course access, on policies, all that allowed us to measure the quality of student experiences and isolate the factors that affect those experiences as well as student achievement. We didn't just ask students, though, about their experiences in class. We asked them about their education and their career goals. And what we found is that 94% of students aspire to college or college and beyond across all demographic groups, all racial groups, all ethnic groups, all income groups, kids are setting their goals high. And they have concrete career plans. Hajima wants to be a neurologist, but she doesn't just want to be a neurologist. I used to have a coach who said, a goal without a plan is just a dream. Well, kids are dreaming, but they're also planning. So Hajima transferred to a high school that specializes in medical careers, and she didn't just do that. She's taking every advanced math class that they offer. Raymond wants to be a police officer. Luce isn't sure exactly what she wants to be, but she really enjoys working with young children. She's thinking about teaching, which is great. Maggie wants to be a, a, a trauma nurse. Isaac wants to be an RN. Uh, kids are aiming high, and they're working hard to reach their goals, we found that 88% of the time, kids are doing what they're asked in, in class. And they're earning good grades. They're not just doing what, what they're asked, they're earning good grades. 80% of the time in our data set, kids are getting A's, B's, or C's, and most of the time they're getting A's and B's. We found that four key resources influence student experience and student achievement. And we use that term resource. Usually, when we say the word resource in education, we're talking about one thing, money, dollars, greenbacks. These four resources turn out to be just as important to student experience and to student success. First, grade level assignments, meaning assignments that give students a chance to meet the demands of standards that are designed to put kids on path for success in college. Second, Strong instruction, 
meaning instruction that asks students to do the majority of the thinking about grade level content, not, for example, to just copy down the answers. Third, deep engagement, meaning students find what they're working on in class to be interesting and enjoyable, and they're concentrating deeply on it. That we know, not just for kids, but for adults as well, is when we learn. Fourth, teachers with high expectations, meaning teachers who believe their students can meet the demands of standards and do grade level work. These four resources, as we'll talk about in a minute, are really important to the quality of student experience and to student achievement, but most kids don't get regular access to even one of these resources, much less all four, and that is especially true for students of color, students from low income backgrounds, English language learners, and students with mild to moderate disabilities. Students are aiming high, they're working hard, they're doing what we're asking, but the choices we're making don't honor their aspirations. Remember, I mentioned a second ago that we analyzed almost 25,000 pieces of student work from across the country. Over 70% of the time, Students met the demands of those assignments, over 70% of the time. But students met grade level standards only 17% of the time on those exact same assignments. That 54% gap represents lots of assignments that simply don't give kids a chance to meet the demands of the standards, even if they get A pluses on those assignments. Opportunity, once again, is a scarce resource in our schools and it's not distributed equitably. And access to opportunity is not about student ability. It's about the choices that we are making at a system level. Students across all demographic groups in our data set can and do meet the bar when we give them a chance. If you look at the assignments in our data set that are actually on grade level, kids of color and white students succeeded with, them, with those assignments, those rigorous assignments, a majority of the time. There's a gap that exists between uh, mastery of students of color versus white students, but it's not a substantial one. The much larger gap is the opportunity gap. In almost 40% of the classrooms where you had a majority of kids of color, while we were studying those classrooms during the course of the year, they didn't get one assignment, not one that was at grade level, not one chance to work on grade level assignments. The comparable statistic for majority white classrooms is 12%. Let's take a look at a couple of assignments from among the 5,000 that we collected to try to make this point. In one eighth grade classroom, in one of the districts we studied, students had a chance to read a mighty long way, which is an eighth grade level text, and write an informational essay, essay analyzing the ways in which the press affected the integration effort of Central High School in Little Rock. In another eighth grade classroom in the same district with very similar student population, students read a fifth grade level text called Billion Oyster Project. Students then filled in vowels to complete the word habitat. This assignment is not aligned to eighth grade literacy standards or in fact any literacy standards at any grade level. Again, it isn't about student ability, it's about the choices we are making. We carefully studied how students spend their time in school. We found that students are spending nearly three quarters of their time on work that isn't grade level, that doesn't give them an opportunity to get prepared to reach their goals. To be clear, we're not claiming that students should spend 100% of their time on grade level assignments. In our top quartile classrooms, about half of the assignments were at grade level. That leaves plenty of time for review for remediation, for meeting kids where they are, for letting kids go at their own pace. The problem is, in the, our bottom quartile classrooms, in the same schools, only 13% of the assignments were on grade level, only 13%. And as we'll see in a minute, that translates to months of lost learning for students who don't get the opportunities. We also measured the quality of instruction, as I mentioned a minute ago including the extent to which students had a chance to do the thinking and the working that allowed them to develop the knowledge and the skills and the confidence that they will need at the next level. Our kids, basically, are kids getting a chance to solve math problems, to do math problems, to, to grapple with them, or are they just copying down the answers from the board? 
We observed almost 900 full period lessons. Only a third used grade level content and only 8% used grade level content and asked students to do the thinking about that content. And of course, we asked students about their experiences in school. Isaac told us that a lot of classes were really dry that involved him just kind of sitting there and taking notes. Raymond thinks math is fun, which is great, but he spends a lot of his time in math class with his head on the desk because the students in Raymond's class don't get to do that much math. We found elementary students had engaging and worthwhile experiences 51% of the time, but that dropped in middle school to 31% of the time and dropped again in high school to 26% of the time. Let me say that again. Only a quarter of the time do high school uh, students think that what their experience is is engaging and worthwhile. More than that, 62% of the time, high school students didn't feel proud of what they were doing. Majority of the time, middle and high school kids didn't feel what they were doing was interesting or useful or enjoyable. 30 to 40% of the time, middle and high school kids didn't feel smart or successful. I think all of us would agree that we can do better and we have to do better. We should do better, that there's innate value in making experiences for kids more joyful, more engaging. But if we're able to do that, as we'll see in a minute, this also will result in student achievement, which will put more kids on track to meet their goals. We were privileged to get the insights from 250 teachers across the country. We learned about the challenges they have in accessing high quality assignments for students. We also have asked, asked about their support for and knowledge of the standards, as well as their expectations for students. What we found is the overwhelming majority of teachers agreed with the standards. They agreed with the content of the standards. They thought the standards were right, 82%. But only 44% of those same teachers believed that their students could meet the demands of those standards. We also found that teachers of color had much higher expectations for students of color, about 30 percentage points higher. That tracks the results of other studies. Uh, this reflects systemic bias. If we, in this case, this was a classroom level study, but if we had studied expectations of administrators or school leaders or system leaders or nonprofit leaders, we would have found the same lowered expectations for students of color. We saw that students have a lot of trust an overwhelming amount of trust in their teachers. 93% of students said their teachers think it's important that they learn a lot. And everything that we observed out in the field reinforced that that trust students have for their teachers is well-founded. We saw dedicated, caring teachers doing their best for their students. And just as students are doing what we ask, teachers are doing what they're asked. They are doing their best to implement their training, to carry out the mandates they've gotten from administration, often under difficult conditions, without much training or support that, for example, would help them build their skill to help students who are behind succeed with grade level, grade level assignments. That's a complex and difficult skill, and we do a particularly terrible job of helping teachers to master it. As we say in the report also, let's not even think of adding more burdens on teachers who already have tremendous burdens if we're not willing to pay them a fair wage and we're not willing to give them the support that they are so hungry for. All right, so how did these factors show up in how kids did, how kids achieved in test scores? Well, it turns out that access to these four critical resources matters to student achievement quite a bit. We analyzed test scores and found that engaged students grew two and a half months more in a single year. Students with teachers who believed they could succeed grew about five months more in a single year. Students with access to grade level assignments grew about two months more in a single year. We didn't see a lot of growth for students with stronger instruction, but we did see that students in classrooms with strong instruction were 31% more engaged, and as you see, engagement leads to higher student achievement. All of these effects were more powerful for students who start out the year substantially behind grade level. What we see is students who are behind are zooming ahead. 
by 7.3 months when they get better assignments, by over six months when they get better instruction, by almost a month in a single year when they're more engaged, by almost eight months in a single year when they have teachers who believe in their ability to succeed. All of this begs the question, if students who are behind benefit so much, achieve at such high levels, when they get access to these critical resources, why are they least likely among all of our students to get access to these resources? Opportunities of scarce resources, I said, and is not distributed equitably. Kids from low-income families, kids of color, systematically across all the systems that we study get far less access, regardless of their prior achievement. This is not about ability, it's about choices made at a systemic level. Kids of color, kids from low-income backgrounds were 25% less likely to receive grade-level assignments. Even high-achieving kids from low-income backgrounds and high-achieving kids of color got 30% less access to grade-level uh, uh, assignments than their peers. Not about ability, it's about choices that we are making. We also saw a racialized, two-tiered grading system where there was a lower bar for students of color. So that, for example, a student of color earning an A in an AP class, in an advanced placement class, had the same chance of passing the AP test as a white student earning a C. This all adds up to us, to a system, where we deny underserved students access to the four critical resources they need to succeed. We then often blame them and their families when they don't succeed, and then we cover up the inequity by telling them that they are fine, everything is fine, when we know that it is not. These are hard truths. I can see it on your faces. They're hard to hear. They're hard for us to hear, because we know at TNTP, we were part of perpetuating the opportunity myth. For example, for many years, training teachers without giving them the training or appreciation for how critical it was for students to get access to grade level assignments without giving the teachers we were responsible for the appreciation for how critical it was that students have teachers with high expectations, regardless of their background, regardless of their prior achievement. But even though there's, there's hard truths in here, there's also in this data, I would say, tremendous hope and a clear path forward. We had dozens of classrooms where kids were engaged 80% of the time. The charter management organization that we studied 60% of the teachers consistently in their, all the schools we studied had high expectations. We had other schools where 80% of the teachers had high expectations for kids coming from underserved backgrounds. Kids who do get access to these critical resources, as we've seen, achieve at much higher levels. They cut gaps significantly to the point where we saw gap cutting in one year where kids are getting these resources for kids who start out the year behind that is, that is so substantial that if students were able to maintain those gains for five years, they would cut the gap with the state average entirely, entirely. The same is true for students of color. So what should we do to eliminate the opportunity myth? It starts for us not with a detailed operational plan, although don't worry, we'll get there but with two commitments, two big commitments that we think are important, we think have to be the bedrock for what we do. If superintendents, elected officials, educators, advocates, parents, support organizations, students pledge that these, these commitments will guide us, then we will begin to tear down the obstacles to education inequality, the obstacles to equity, the obstacles to excellence, that if we're really honest with ourselves over the last couple of decades, we've only been able to scratch the surface of. The first commitment involves recognizing that all students should have consistent access to engaging experiences, grade level assignments, strong instruction, and high expectations every day, every school, every class, that will measure access to these resources. We'll own up to it where we're not providing them and work every day to do better, to provide more students with more opportunity. The second involves fundamentally changing the way we in school systems relate to students, parents, and communities. Typically, if we're honest, we hold them at arm's length. But in doing so, we are denying ourselves access to the greatest experts about our schools. 
So we, so what we should do is bring parents, bring students in, bring them in, give them seats at the table, solicit information about their goals and their experiences and their ideas about how we can do better, provide them with clear, accurate information about how students are doing against those goals and continually seek their feedback.